Good evening, everyone. This is the first of two keynote addresses. Uh, it's our privilege to have as the first keynote speaker, Dr. Dale Irvin, president of New York Theological Seminary, and as many of you know, a cutting edge theorist in world Christianity and a prolific contributor to our field. Now, in listening to several panels today, I've already heard Dale cited how many times? Um, <laughs> nearly half a dozen, it seemed. Among his numerous publications, uh, let me single out for a special mention his co-authored series on the history of the world Christian movement in two volumes, the first on the period of the earliest Christianity to 1453, and the second on the period from, 18, from 15, 1454 to 1900. Uh, if you would like to see a copy, uh, you go into the main library through the entrance over here, and what we call the drum on this wall, which is kind of a rounded area uh, display case, you'll see his book there and um, several others as well. Uh, now, both of those volumes of the history of the World Christian Movement have been used here at Princeton Theological Seminary uh, over the years in the history of Christianity curriculum. Besides these, of course, Dale has other publications, uh, too many to mention in a short introduction. As for Dale's articles, which are likewise numerous, I'd like to draw attention to one in particular that was for us here at the seminary especially illuminating. I refer to an article that appeared first, uh, it's been republished since in other collections, in the inaugural issue of the Journal of World Christianity in 2008 under the title World Christianity and Introduction. Among many clarifying observations, Dale had this to say. Now, Dean James Kay, sitting here in the front, uh, who welcomed all of us earlier today, quoted this same passage. Uh, it's well worth reiteration. As a field of study, world Christianity has its historical roots in the disciplines of missions, ecumenics, and world religions. It continues to pursue a threefold conversation across borders of culture, historically the domain of mission studies, across borders of confession or communion, historically the domain of ecumenics, and across borders with other religious faiths, historically the domain of world religions. Beyond these, it seeks to engage other areas of the theological curriculum and the social sciences. Now that passage, as you might have noticed, names the three fields, mission, ecumenics, and the history of religions, that had named our program here at Princeton for 36 years. It was no, in no small measure, thanks to Dale, that we decided to update our nomenclature and rename our program. So, sir, a tip of the hat to you for that. As for the keynote address we're about to hear, it will, I'm, I'm sure, throw a great deal of additional light on our history as a field of study. After Dale has finished, uh, questions and comments will be entertained. We may have 15 to 20 minutes for that purpose. So please welcome Dale. Well, I'm honored and a bit embarrassed by such words, because I don't think I deserve them. But I certainly am glad to be here, and I want to thank, first of all, the organizers of the conference this afternoon. I am really excited about what's emerging here at Princeton in the program in World Christianity, History of Religions. Um, to Professors Young, Beretto, and Ad Adogami, thank you for your leadership in this field, and thank you for bringing us here and for encouraging us in scholarship. The theme of the conference, Currents, Perspectives, and Methodologies in World Christianity is timely. It's pressing us to look beyond the assumptions that are often reflected in modern literature, contemporary literature, popular literature, and look more carefully at both the perspectives and the methods of our fields, as we've been hearing already today. 
A key feature of the WCHR program here at Princeton is its commitment to engaging multiple methodologies, including those from the social sciences, and not just in one theological perspective. It reflects an understanding of the field that is irreducibly multi-perspectival and dialogical, and it allows for unresolved tensions and even contradictions to coexist. And that makes it an open-ended field when it comes to anticipating what comes next. And so it's along these lines I want to use the occasion of this presentation here this afternoon, first of all, to acknowledge that I learned about that threefold network from the pr program here at Princeton, having been a student here in the 19, late 70s and early 80s. And so in many ways, it's come back home to roost right from Princeton. Um, but I also want to think more collectively about what we're doing in this field called world Christianity. I prepared a much longer paper in advance, which I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. It was sent out. I have some copies here. You're welcome to email me. And if you want a copy of it, um, I'm ready to send it electronically and to keep the conversation open. I really am here to hear from the rest of you this weekend and to learn more about what we're doing together. World Christianity, I said in my paper, is something of a growth industry these days. Over the past several decades, the number of books, the journals, the articles, the blogs that have appeared on the subject is considerable. The number of scholars from various disciplines who've come on board this ship, World Christianity, is equally considerable. Just look around this room. Growth in the field has brought with it, though, as we've heard already today, considerable confusion regarding what precisely our work is about. What in the world is world Christianity, we keep asking. When it comes to defining what the world means, we don't yet have a consensus. Fifteen years ago, in a personal conversation, Professor Laman Sane remarked to me that one of the tasks, he thought, of world Christianity is to challenge what he called the tribalism that too often characterizes the work of our colleagues in the academy. His remark captured precisely the problem that's, pre that's plagued our understanding of Christianity as a world religion or a religion throughout the world. For most of the modern era, by which I mean the last 500 years, both in scholarship and in popular understanding, Christianity in the West, as well as in other parts of the globe, has been defined as a European religion. European expressions, European institutions, and European practices have been taken as being normative. Under those conditions, Christian actually referred to one tribe, European Christian. World then gets added to the term, said Raman Sane, when we're seeking to study something more than just European Christianity on its own. World Christianity in this regard has a subversive role to play in the world of scholarship. Now, it's heartening for me to see the results of the efforts that Professor Sané and others like him over the last several decades have had in broadening theological learning, moving us beyond Western tribalism in the academy. This gathering is but one more example of the manner in which our work and his work is bearing fruit. But still, the lack of consensus and understanding what we are studying presents a stumbling block to our work. I don't want to remove the stumbling block. I want to see how we can build on it. I find the recently published volume, Relocating World Christianity, that Joel Cabrita, David Maxwell, and Emma Wildwood have edited, that was the subject of a panel here this afternoon, I find it to be making a significant contribution in this regard. Building on the work of Klaus Korshoka, who's here, and others, Relocating World Christianity argues that the study of world Christianity needs to be more than just the study of various local expressions of Christianity around the world. Our work in world Christianity is to make comparisons and connections, probe networks of exchange or lack of them, and bring into view for consideration what Roland Robertson calls the pan-local dimensions of our world. Relocating world Christianity makes the case that what is being called world Christianity is not something new. From the earliest days of the Christian movement, followers of Jesus of Nazareth have sought to carry their message to the ends of the earth. David Maxwell writes, quote, Christianity has always been a missionary religion with universalist aspirations. I agree. Beginning in the 15th century, the universal aspirations of Christians in Western Europe 
became caught up in the historical developments of European colonial expansion. But even through the modern era, the universal aspirations of Christianity were never entirely reducible to Western imperialism and colonialism. The reason this point needs to be made is that historical, historically, the universalizing dimension or aspect of Christianity is not reducible to modern European colonialism. Thomas Tangaraj, among others, has noted the importance of this insight for studying world Christianity today. I have a much longer quote from him in, in my paper. The point is to emphasize the inclusive nature of what he calls the, quote, the Catholicity of Christianity. Now, for some scholars, it appears that world Christianity as a field of study is a function of the fact that Christian churches can be found now on all six inhabited continents of the globe. Beyond this is an often unstated assumption that Christianity only truly became a world religion in the modern era. The assumption or assertion begs the question as to whether the concept of world properly refers to continental representation. Would world Christianity come to an end if there were no longer any Christians or churches found in one or more nations or regions of the globe in some future time? Tangaraj's argument is that world refers not to a geographic location, but rather to openness and inclusion, not necessarily a geographic distribution or dominance. For others, the assertion that world Christianity is a recent phenomena refers not to the extent to which Christians and churches are distributed throughout the globe, but rather to the manner in which the wider global dimensions of the religion are conceptualized or understood. But as Cabrita and Maxwell point out in their introduction, this is precisely the dimension of world Christianity that has been underdeveloped. Maxwell makes the case at one point in relocating Christianity that the phrase world Christianity is a branding of an old style mission studies. In part, I agree with him, but I think a better case is made in the introduction to the same book that the rebranding is actually of the 20th century ecumenical movement and the body of scholarship that emerged from what is often called ecumenics and ecumenical studies. This is not to deny mission studies its prominent place in the genealogy of world Christianity. It is rather to complexify it a bit more. This is where the rest of my paper wants to take us. I want to look, engage in a genealogy of world Christianity to uncover the manner in which I think the name is a rebranding of what once was called the ecumenical movement or ecumenical studies. This is not to deny a connection between mission studies and world Christianity. As was widely acknowledged throughout the 20th century, the ecumenical movement emerged in part from the missionary movement of the 19th century. Alongside the closely re and closely related to missionary movement at the end of the 19th century, in the beginning of the 20th century, there was another movement, however, one that was concerned for the unity of the churches. This other movement sought to make trans-regional and trans-confessional connections in and among various Christian communities or communions in terms of their faith and order or their doctrines and practices. The 20th century ecumenical movement, as was widely recognized by those who were a part of it, was a result of the merging of those two streams of renewal. The twin poles, or the imperatives, of unity and mission were an axiom of the ecumenical movement. Why this is important is that it does not allow us to erase whole sections of world Christianity from our perspectives. Rarely, for instance, if ever, do orthodox churches make their way into mission studies other than to protest the aggressive proselytism of, of evangelicals and Pentecostals in the regions of the world that were orthodox churches were historically prominent. But to ignore orthodoxy in our study of world Christianity is a huge mistake and distorts what we're looking at. And I would point out the absence of orthodox presence even here at this conference. It also keeps before us the reality that what we are looking at is not a unified field. The genealogy of our field of study is more complicated than mission studies on its own would allow us to see. 
The 20th century ecumenical quest for the unity of the churches out of which faith and order movement emerged is often traced to the four-point platform of the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral of 1888. That four-point platform was first proposed in 1870 by William Reed Huntington, a priest in the Episcopal Church, USA, in a book titled The Church Idea, An Essay Toward Unity. In 1870, the United States was not yet a global colonial power. It was a young nation whose history was that of a series of settlement colonies still trying to forge a national identity. It had just been through a devastating civil war and was in the throes of a failing reconstruction in the South. The US was still regarded in 1870 by Rome as a mission land, not a Christian land. Huntington's proposal called for Anglican Catholics and Roman Catholics in the missionary location, the mission field where they found themselves, called the United States, to unite into a common church of the reconciliation. Both were to some degrees, he said, aliens in these United States, and as migrants and aliens, they should unite and form a new kind of Catholic church, the Catholic Church of the Reconciliation. His proposal was that they would unite on the basis of four principles. Holy Scripture is the word of God, the early creeds of the rule of faith, the two sacraments of baptism and Eucharist ordained by Christ and the historic episcopate as the cornerstone. That was the basis for the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral, which was then extended to other communions around the world in an invitation to join in a process that project was propelled by the excitement of the 1910 World Missionary Conference in Edinburgh, which is often cited as the beginning of the ecumenical movement. That's why Gunther Grasmann claims a century later that faith and order was essentially an Anglican project. Huntington's book was published just as Vatican I was being convened. Six years later, in 1876, Responding to the manner in which Rome appropriated the term ecumenical for its council, the Methodist Episcopal Church in the USA North at its general conference issued a call for an ecumenical conference of Methodism. The purpose of such a conference would be to gather representatives from Methodist churches around the world to demonstrate their visible connectedness in the same way that the recent Vatican Synod had done for Roman Catholics. A.C. George, the Methodist minister who initiated the call, envisioned other Protestants eventually joining in what he called a parliament of Protestantism. George argued that this would in fact aid in world evangelization, which would in turn help bring about the millennial return of Christ. World evangelization, foreign missions were not disconnected from these efforts of church unity. Both came to be associated with the term ecumenical among Protestants and Anglicans. One sees these in the expanding horizons of William Taylor's paper on the unity and cooperation in foreign missions that was delivered in the 1888 Centenary Conference on the Protestant Missions at the World in London. I have a longer quote from Taylor in the fuller version of my paper. You can read it. In the discussion that followed his paper, Taylor called for an ecumenical council of Protestant and Anglicans to be held in the new, near future, not to frame new creeds, not to fight over old battles, but to organize completely for the propagation of the gospel throughout the world. The term ecumenical, he says, means worldwide. William Reed Huntington, who had first proposed that fourfold platform for unity among Anglican and Roman Catholics, that became the basis for the faith and order movement, he was at the 1900 ecumenical conference in New York City, because by then he had moved to become rector of Grace Church in Manhattan. He explained that ecumenical means nothing more than the whole world wherever human beings live. The World Missionary Conference that met in Edinburgh in 1910 is without question a major event in the history of the ecumenical movement, and it stays so in world Christianity. But Edinburgh 1910 also figures prominently in the wider history of the, of the 20th century in a way that has not often been appreciated. A genealogical investigation turns up Edinburgh 1910 not only as a major milestone on the road towards ecumenical unity and the ecumenical movement, 
It was a major factor in precipitating one of the major divides in the 20th century that ended up separating churches all over the world. To Edinburgh and its immediate aftermath, we can trace the roots of the evangelical ecumenical divide that emerged primarily in Anglo-American Protestant theology in the 20th century, but then grew to global proportions. The evangelical ecumenical divide did not exist at the turn of the 20th century in Anglo-American Protestant theologies. There was an emerging divide between conservative and liberal theological movements, and later what became known as fundamentalist or modernist in the North American context, but neither of these led directly to the ecumenical evangelical divide. The genealogy, as we heard this morning, of the modern ecumenical movement leads one back to the student volunteer movement for foreign missions, founded in 1888 under the leadership of John Mott. Two years earlier, Mott had attended the college student summer school that Dwight Moody sponsored in the campus of his Mount Hermon School in Northfield, Massachusetts. It was there that Mott heard Arthur Tappan Pearson issue a call for the evangelization of the world in this generation. Before the summer was out, Mott and others were laying the groundwork for the student volunteer movement. Two years later, Mott went to work for the YMCA in a position that he had to travel extensively throughout the world. Everywhere he went, he ordered volunteer movements which became Christian movements on campuses. The SCM's student Christian movements were all Protestant. In 1895, Mott brought the leadership together in Sweden, they formed the World Student Christian Federation. In 1899, Baron Paul Nikolay, a Lutheran whose family had served the Russian government, organized an SCM in St. Petersburg, Russia. Initially, it was only made up of Protestants, but in 1902, Russian Orthodox students were allowed to join and begin to participate as members. As with other local SCMs, participants were encouraged to develop a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, nurtured through prayer, prayer, Bible study, and other activities. Orthodox students were not told to leave the Orthodox Church, but were admitted to the St. Petersburg chapter as Orthodox. By 1909, Mott was ready to move in that direction. During his second visit to Russia in 1909, he set up leaders with the Russian Orthodox Church. Mott assured them that he was not there to proselytize. The assurance did little to persuade the Holy Synod to accept the WSCF at that point. A similar change was taking place in England among leaders of the SCM after 1900. Students holding evangelical convictions had initially formed the overwhelming majority of SCMs in England, but by 1908, high church or Anglo-Catholics had begun to embrace the movement. The Anglo-Catholic participation in Edinburgh 1910 was a huge result of this participation. The watershed there was that in order to include Anglo-Catholics, Mott and others agreed to take Latin America off the agenda for 1910 as a missionary land, and a move which angered many of the evangelicals. The decisions were viewed as being a betrayal of the ecumenical movement. As one person has written, at length, the inclusivist policy reached a point at Edinburgh where the evangelicals felt that the gospel itself was being neglected for ecumenism and the authority of the Bible not to speak of the certain doctrines that are essential to evangelical faith were being displaced. Mott, on the other hand, persisted. And he began after Edinburgh to reach out intentionally to the Orthodox churches. In Istanbul, he had an influential audience with the ecumenical patriarch who gave his blessings, and for the first time after 1911, they changed the constitution of the WFCF to admit Christians of any communion, not just Protestants. That is important to see because the ecumenical movement's initial inclusivism, which became an issue evangelicals criticized later in the century, had nothing to do with liberalism. It had everything to do with Romanism and high church. What was at stake in the weakening of doctrine was the evangelical doctrine of justification by faith alone. Inclusion of orthodox was seen by some in the student Christian movement as being a betrayal of the central doctrines of Christian faith, Protestant Christian faith. In the aftermath, Leaders were accused of supporting Romanism. Students at Cambridge took the lead, and by 1920, they had organized a new 
international network of evangelical student movements that became InterVarsity, and the rest is history. Before the delegates left 1910 in Edinburgh, they voted to establish a continuation committee that eventually became the International Missionary Council. The IMC was a deliberative body made up mostly of Western boards and societies, but unlike Faith and Order and Life and Work, the other two main conferences that were organized, it provided a better platform for Asian, African, and eventually Latin American voices to be heard. The IMC held its first international conference in 1928. By 1938, 10 years later at Tambaram, more than half the delegates were from Asia or Africa. 61 of the 471 participants at Tambaran were from India. Western accounts of that conference have often typically noted the, book of the, the work of Henry Kramer, which was commissioned by Mott, the Christian message in a non-Christian world. Often remember that as being the keynote or the heart of the conference, asserting the necessity for proclaiming Jesus Christ as the ultimate measure of truth over against other religions and philosophies. But there was another perspective at Tambaran, which is mostly remembered by Asian theologians. A group of Indian theologians under the leadership of G.V. Job published in advance of the conference a book called Rethinking Christianity in India. I think that book is more important than Kramer's uh, Christian message in a non-Christian world. Rethinking Christianity in India is sometimes described as being written in reaction, Kramer. It's not true. It was not the case. The volume emerged from a preliminary conference held by Indian theologians in Bangalore. It challenged directly the Western missionary rejection of the religions of India as being without theological value and offered instead a positive assessment of the religious heritage of India informing Christian faith. Various contributors to the volume argued that the spirit of God was at work outside Christian churches in a positive manner in the religions of India and that revelation was not limited to the Hebrew people before Christ. The methodology it employed implicitly was one of comparative theologies and dialogue with the religions and cultural heritage of India. The Indian theologians at Tambaram were joined by other Asian delegates in rejecting Kramer's negative evaluation of the religions of Asia. Their efforts called for a new approach to the religious history of Asia more generally. Within a generation, that effort took hold institutionally within the ecumenical movement. Another generation and the project blossomed. A wider ecumenism of interreligious dialogue and comparative theologies emerged, what Raimondo Panikar famously called ecumenical ecumenism. Interreligious studies have fully joined intercultural and interconfessional studies now as part of the wider academic project that we're involved in. Back to Princeton, and they didn't pay me to say this, so I'm telling you the truth. The convergence of these three trajectories is already apparent in 1937, when John Mackay inaugurated a new chair in ecumenics here in Princeton Seminary, the first such chair in a North American theological school only a year after he became president. Princeton Seminary had played a major role in introducing mission studies into the curriculum of theological education at the end of the 19th century. The appointment of Edward Jurgi to the Princeton faculty in 1942 by, by Mackay brought with it a decided change in perspective regarding other religions. A Presbyterian who had been born in Syria into a Christian family, Jurgi became a strong proponent of interreligious dialogue and pluralism here in the curriculum at Princeton. His lasting influence isn't just on Richard Young's appointment in his work, but it was to bring together the interreligious dialogue fully along the study of missions and ecumenics in the curriculum. Three decades later, the winds of change brought a shift. Differences within the ecumenical movement itself that had been moderate in the 1940s became ideologically charged. Efforts to respond to the revolutionary events of the 1960s proved to be especially divisive. Secularism was seen by many as setting a new agenda for theology. The work of ecumenical theologians such as Richard Shaw here at Princeton and Letty Russell at Yale turned from missions to liberation. The formation of the Ecumenical Association of Third World Theologians, or ETWAT, in 1960, 
76, I think is an important indication of where this new ecumenical direction was going. The eventual numerical demise, decline in membership among what were called mainline or established churches in North America and to a degree in Western Europe that those had been identified with the ecumenical movement, coupled with the ascendancy of evangelical churches and Pentecostals who were already suspicious of ecumenism, many of whom had been left out intentionally from the ecumenical conversations, resulted in the shrinking and marginalizing not only of the institutions of ecumenical life, such as the World Council, but of a very language of ecumenism. As some have said, an ecumenical winter set in. Evangelical scholars who are now working in the field of world Christianity have often noted their debt to the work of an earlier generation of ecumenical missiologists, and especially the 1952 IMC Willingen Conference. In this regard, evangelicals have picked up significant aspects of the ecumenical project and carried it forward. The same can be said, I think, for scholarship that's been generated from Roman Catholic context. Vatican II brought the Roman Catholic Church into the ecumenical movement. As it did, however, it also had the, the effect of emphasizing the interconfessional aspects of the term ecumenical. The Council's decree on ecumenism concerns itself with realizing the visible unity of Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Protestant churches of the world. Separate documents from Vatican II dealt with questions concerning missions and the relation to other religions. Catholic scholarship in the field of world Christianity over the past five decades has in no small part been shaped by a renewed sense of interconfessional dialogue, the intentional development of regional perspectives, and multiple dialogical engagements with other religions. These developments within the Catholic world are yet a further reason why the field of world Christianity cannot simply be reduced to mission studies. The overall result of these global developments over the past several decades, I think, has been a significant diminishment in the term of ecumenism or ecumenics. Scholarship has then followed suit. World Christianity emerged in the 1990s, a term which dates back to 1915 in a New York Times article, was picked up in the 1920s, became the title of Van Dusen's book in 1947, was the title of the program that I attended at Union in 1980, World Christianity emerged in the 1990s as a preferred alternative to Mackay's The Science of Ecumenics. The danger for me has been to leave the field of mission st studies standing alone as the predecessor to the study of world Christianity, and thereby missing the fuller picture. I'm not advocating that we dust off, dust off old terminology. I simply argue it's important to see the historical genealogy of our field and to become clearer concerning what we are studying. World Christianity as a field of study is at its best for me when studying things that are crossing, the transcultural, the transconfessional, the transregional, or things that take place in the interstices, the intersections, the intercultural, interconfessional, or interreligious dialogue. Dare I say that this is where our scholarship, with all of our theological baggage, as somebody said earlier today, this is where it takes us when we keep looking for transcendence and what comes next. Thank you. <laughs>